always watching it as a kid. But it wasn't until they were an adult that they actually noticed something. And they actually kind of alluded to it in this little skit. But when Linus, I believe it was Linus, right? He went up on stage. Who was the guy that always had, like, the, the security blanket? Well, he was the one. They're like, There's, we're missing something here at Christmas. There's always, you know, something's going on that we're missing. And Linus gets up to the stage, which is the guy that was, like, super shy. And he grabbed the mic. And as soon as he started telling the Christmas story, that he, he let the blanket go. I'm crying over Charlie Brown here. <laughs> but it's just something that's that kind of like stuck with me and I guess that would be the revelation that I've received, you know, that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that we don't have to hold on to the things that we hold that we hold on so dear that we think are what keep us safe. You know, it could be our retirement, it could be family, it could be different relationships, but if if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we don't have any security at all. Amen. We're going to do some reading this morning. Um, I felt it that we necessarily, usually we kind of have, we read a little bit and then we talk um, on, a, on a certain topic, Christmas topic, but I wanted to do some reading this morning, um, if you don't mind, uh, this morning, just to, just to read. It's not going to be both accounts. It's going to be mostly of Luke's account of the Christmas story. So we're going to be reading. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. We're going to be beginning, start reading in uh, chapter 1 from 26 to 38 and then skipping over to chapter 2 and reading some scripture there. We braved it in. We made it in through the ice, through the sleet, through the snow. Amen? We could work for the post office. <laughs> anyway, so... Let's uh, turn it. You guys there in your Bibles? We should have it up on the screen if you're able to bring your Bible this morning. But let's read, shall we? Chapter 1, verse 26 and beginning, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. I know Tyler was telling me earlier that that was his life scripture for a short time. 29. But when he, she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also what the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for who who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now let's go skip over into chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2 in verse 1 and read as follows. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This censor first, census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Excuse me. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign for you. 
you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. This morning, I kind of wanted to talk just briefly on the first text that we read from verses 26 through 38. And the title of this sermon, the topic, the subject, whatever you want to call it, is a change of plan. That there's been a change of plans. How many know that in the Christmas season, there's always something that happens to what, that brings a change of plans? Amen? Something that's certain happens. But before we begin, let me, let me just pray and ask God to, to be able to be with us and speak to us in this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you're with us. We thank you for all that we can celebrate in the birth of our Savior, who not only was born, but he was born to die for us, and that he would rise on the third day, overcoming death and hell and sin. And we thank you as we celebrate today. We ask that you would continue to, to speak to us, what you would have spoken into our hearts and in our minds, that would continue to bring change, Lord, that you would challenge us and bring that new life that you want so dearly and deeply inside of us being established. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said? I don't know, how many of you guys are, are planners out there? You guys would consider yourself a planner. It's usually typically the firstborn. But how many, you could raise your hand, how many of you guys would be more on the planner side? Like, I like to plan things. I like to have my life goals. I like to have my things, you know, in order. Right? It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're cool, you know. Planners are good. Planners are pretty much, might be what, what's keeping the world going on right now. You know, I mean, there's some dreamers, but how many of you guys don't plan? You don't really like to plan. You're, you kind of uh, like to live on the wild edge. You like to shoot from the hip, so to speak. You know, you just kind of like take it as it comes and just, yeah, you know, maybe. There's different, there's different variations. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a last born, and my wife is too, so that's kind of a struggle. Usually it's like if you're last born, you marry a first born. Sorry, I, I am OCD in some ways, like that row wasn't lined up. But anyways, but, <laughs> so sometimes I do have some first trait characteristics, but we're last born, so we kind of, we're not really planners. We do like to plan, and I know for some of us, we like to plan on certain areas of our lives, and some areas we don't. For some of us, we like to set out our, our year goal, five-year goal for our careers and our life, what we want to do, but... Also, we don't like to plan in the essence of, I don't want to plan out what I'm going to be eating for the next week. We don't want to plan dinner out, right? Oh. Anyways, so how many know that in life, through situations, whether it be God, whether it just be the world that we live in, that there are changes of plans that happens in our life? Christmas season, there always seems to be some type of a plans that go awry, that go wrong, something screws up, because we have this idea of Christmas being so perfect. We have this Christmas that has been placed in front of us on the old silver screen of everything turning out good, of everything glamorized, posterized, GQ'd out, everything has makeup on it, and is, and is I mean, it's like Christmas cards, right? How many of you guys love getting Christmas cards? I love getting Christmas cards, right? You get to see, oh man, I haven't seen like, people that we used to know, maybe down in, in San Diego or elsewhere, a family that you haven't seen for a long time. You see these Christmas cards, you're like, oh look, they're such a happy family. Everything's going good. Praise the Lord. Look at their kids, they're getting up so big. But how many know, I know Charity knows this, how many know that life is not everything that's portrayed on a Christmas card? Not only life, what about the photo shoot? How many know that it is hard to get those kids to smile at the perfect time and then praise the Lord for technology. Now you can actually take a head where they were smiling and put it on a picture so that everyone's like, looks like they're actually there. So you're actually superimposing, right? 
And that's what can be done nowadays. And so we continuously put this, this image of a perfect Christmas before us and think everything has to go right. And if it doesn't, my life's a failure. We have these wrong perceptions. But how many know that the very first Christmas didn't go as planned? It wasn't perfect. That it got messy. That things happened. And if you read through the, the both stories, the one here in Luke and even in Matthew, that you also see that there's, there's hardship that takes place. There was a guy named King Herod, and he was over the Jews. He wasn't Jewish. He was from, the, from, um, from Esau's race, so he's an Edomite. If you want to go through all that kind of stuff. But he was king over the Jews. He heard from these wise men that were traveling and saying, oh, where's this new baby boy that's born to be the king? And he hears about it, and he gets upset, and he gets angry. And what does he do? He finds out about this and finds out from his theologians in his court where this baby is to be born. And these religious leaders, these religious people, tell King Herod, knowing that he's an evil king, that he kills almost his whole family, where the baby's to be born. In Micah, in Micah 5, I believe it is, it tells us that he's to be born in Bethlehem. So these people, knowing who who this king is like, what he's like, he actually has everyone in that region of Bethlehem under the age of two as firstborn son killed. That happened in the time of Christmas, right? There's some stuff that goes on that we need to know that we can't over-glamorize it and become so frustrated. The scripture we were talking about when Gabriel came to, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, She had her life all planned out, I'm sure. She was betrothed to Joseph. She was kind of engaged, but it's one step past that. They went through the engagement, then it was the betrothal, and then it was supposedly from around approximately one year from that point that they would actually get married. And so to break off a betrothal, you would actually have to get a certificate of divorce. So it's pretty much like you're married to a person. So we find out that this news is brought to Mary in a time that can be a great stress for a woman. How many, how many here have, have been married? How many here, you've noticed something that instinctively happens? All of a sudden, something starts to happen with this woman that you've come to know and you've come to love. And maybe she wasn't even a planner. And all of a sudden, you get engaged, and all of a sudden, she becomes a planner. Right? All of a sudden, this woman who knew was to be a planner, and you're like, you know, that's kind of attractive. Yeah, she's, she's got her life goals planned out. She's, she's ready to go. All of a sudden, she's a planner, and all of a sudden, she gets engaged. She becomes Bridezilla. She becomes an overplanner, right? All of a sudden, something happens. And it doesn't say, it, doesn't say it, you know, that she's planning, but how many know that there is some supernatural hyperdrive instinctive thing that comes on in a woman's life when all of a sudden she becomes engaged? And it doesn't even have to be the woman that's engaged, right? All of a sudden it's like she won the, the super lotto, the, what is the big Powerball 1 billion lotto, and all of a sudden all the family members start to get involved like they want a piece of it. So all of a sudden, you don't have just the woman, you have the mom, you have the aunties, you have the sisters, you have every other person that wants to get involved in this. And it's just something that happens with women. Can I, am I lying to you, man? Am I lying? Come on. No. So I know that this couldn't have just been something that only happens now. But it happened to Mary. You know that Mary had to be planning her life out, that she was excited, that she was, she was going to be married to this man. She was given in marriage. It was probably an arranged marriage, but you know that she was excited, right? She was probably getting ready, planning out her wedding. She was probably practicing to write her name out with her new name, Mary Carpenter. (laughs) I mean, Joseph the Carpenter, I don't know. Joseph, son of Jacob. Anyway, she was probably already planning on how she was going to change her new husband, right? (laughs) Anyways. That was that may have been too far. <laughs> Anyways. But she had a change of plan. Gabriel comes to her and says, Mary, there's been a change of plans. What happens? He tells her that she's going to give birth to God, in essence. And she's kind of struck. She's kind of in awe. She's like, what's going on? How can this be? 
How, am I, how is Joseph going to take this? How am I supposed to tell Joseph that I'm pregnant and it's not your baby? Because he'd have to know because we can talk about that later in, another, in a Sunday school class or I'll let your parents talk to that if you don't know that yet. But all of a sudden there becomes a change of plans. For many of us that can send chills down our spines, right? There's been a change of plans. How many like to travel during Christmas? We travel, I, I, I like it sometimes, but sometimes I don't. I'm going to be flying out this next week to go visit Emily's, Emily's folks, and, and it's going to be good, and it's going to be fun, and we're going to have a good time. But what happens when you're in a airport? If you fly and you're in a airport, all of a sudden you hear the overcom. Excuse me, people, there's been a change of plans. How many, how many all of a sudden it's just like, forget Christmas. You know, I'm not going here, change my flight, I'm going to Hawaii. I don't want, you know, a change of plans going on in my life. But that's what happens in essence, and it doesn't even happen, have to to happen in the Christmas season. That we all sometimes have change of plans that happen in our life, whether it be our choice, whether it be God's plans, or whether it be plans that other people, maybe the, the people that aren't planners, spring on us, right? It's the second group of people. I'm starting to get down to the nitty-gritty now. That we can go through these change of plans that happen. Some can be good, some that can be bad, and even some can be devastating. This news was definitely good, but it presented itself as it looked devastating. we got to think back now that many of us know this story. Many of us have heard sermons our whole life on the Christmas story. Women at this time in this era were placed a little higher than a, than a floor mat. All of a sudden, what would happen? All of a sudden, she becomes, she becomes pregnant by God out of wedlock. What could happen? That's devastating news to someone. But it turned out to be glorious. It turned out to be good news. But in the here and now, it looked like it was devastating. It could have cost so much. It could have cost her marriage. And for many people, we're thankful that Joseph was a just and righteous man, it says in Matthew, because he was going to actually put her away quietly in Matthew's account which means he was going to divorce her after everything kind of settled down. So we know that there, there caused a stir in the community that were, they were living in, in Nazareth. The law in Deuteronomy, we can read about that when a woman becomes pregnant out of wedlock, that she could have been stoned, that she could have died. But praise the Lord, this was one of God's plans. This was God's purpose, and he protected her. But in the here and now, it looked devastating. Many of us have had problems and had our plans changed because of devastations in life. We've had things come into our lives that caused all hell to break loose. And we think, God, how can, how can this happen? How can you let this happen to me? I thought I'm doing your will. I thought that you want me to plan out my life. I thought you called me up from San Diego to live up here and to, to be able to be a pastor and be able to, to take over this awesome church and, and now all of a sudden my wife has a false labor. Has, we have a baby that dies. What happens when you go through hardship? She was so far along we had to get a procedure done and surgery and to be able to see an unborn child. But we're supposed to believe with faith and speak in faith. And, and all of a sudden, we go back to the sonograms before this operation takes place. And like, no, we're praying. We're believing. Three days in a row, we went and made appointments and prayed in faith to start to see that heartbeat. Because we could see the form, but no, it wasn't. What do you do when devastation happens? When divorce comes? What happens when I thought my parents were going to be married forever? Now I have to split Christmas and split holidays. What happens when this job that you love to do, all of a sudden something happens, you thought everyone at work liked you, and all of a sudden you lose your job? What happens when plans go wrong, when plans change? What happens when this person that they seem to love you, they seem to want to be with you all the time, all of a sudden just walks out and you never see or hear from them again? What happens? Mary was in this boat 
Things could have happened to her life because of God's change plans for her life. Mary, there's been a change of plans. I know that you're planning a wedding. I know that you're, you haven't even finished your, your wedding registry, but now you've got to plan a, a baby registry. There's been a change of plans. We don't like hearing that, do we? There's been a change of plans. What are the plans that have been changed in your life that you've went through? What are the plans that have happened this last year even that you thought was going to go right and all of a sudden there's been a change of plans? In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Many of us know this scripture and love it, and we get kind of all stirred up when we speak it and hear it prayed forth. He now has plans for me. He's going to prosper me. He's giving me a future. He's giving me a hope. Come on. I know it stirs you up when you guys want that. You hear that. It's like, yes, I'm, gonna, I'm an overcomer. I'm faith-filled. I'm going to do this. God is with me. Who can be against me? I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. But there's something that has struck me as I've been able to study the word more, that sometimes we take this scripture out of context. Because if you find out, I don't have it up there, but in verse 10 of 29, it's actually they're in Babylon. They're in captivity because they weren't obedient to what God had for them. They weren't obedient to God's laws and God's commandments. And so they found themselves in a situation, in bondage, in captivity, and God speaks, I know the plans I have for you. In the here and now, you might not know the plans he has for you, but God knows, amen? That he knows the plans he has for you. That if you've called upon his name, and he's your savior, he's your Lord, that he has a plan for you. You might not see it now. You might be ten steps away, five steps away, or even a decade away from what those plans actually are, but God has a plan for your life. And the thing that that has struck me in recent time is going through this scripture because we love to read it Uh, baccalaureate services to to kids that are uh, graduating, knowing that they have the whole future ahead of them. But there's something in there that has struck me to the nerve and to the core that also needs to be preached. And that is, if you read it over again, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and then what next? Not to harm you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Another translation says, not for calamity. And another, not of evil. That means that we can take God's plans the wrong way. That in his promise, in his very promise of a future and a hope, he has to help decipher, you might be in harm's way. You might be in a devastating place. There might be calamity all around you. All you can see is evil. But my plans will prosper. That we can misunderstand God's plans for our lives. I'm sure there was a great misunderstanding with God's plans for Mary and Joseph's life. They may have been disowned. They may have been cast out of society for a time. But in the end, they followed through with faith, knowing that that was God's word. Even though it spoke, I wish I was, I wish Gabriel came and spoke to me. But I know I'm not going to give birth to the, I mean, he's, he's, he's precious, he's perfect. But he's not the next Messiah. Yeah, I don't give birth. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen from the man? Oh, praise the Lord. Women are tough. Women are beautiful. You need to, you need to blow the bank on your wife or your girl this Christmas. Amen? Come on, ladies. I'm trying to help you out. But that God has these plans for our lives. And they followed through with faith. They could have lived in fear, and I'm sure they were in fear when they had to go to Bethlehem, when they couldn't find room in the inn, wherever it could be, when all of a sudden a, a, someone came to them, even though all this awesome stuff was happening, shepherds were coming in and saying, these angels talk to us and saying about your son, that he's the savior of the world. Like, oh, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. Like, ne- ne- next comes to this scene, the magi, the wise men, and they're saying, we followed a star and here's some gifts. And one thing that we always think is, oh, it's just a box of gold. It's a box. It was like a huge retinue. If there's only three people that came to Herod, you think that would have caused a disruption in a kingdom? You know that there was a mass quantity of people, that there was a mass of people. They, they only 
say that because those are the three gifts given. But we have to understand that this had to be a great retinue, a great mass of people that came from the east to see this king. But stuff happened. There was no room for them. They went through hardship. They get a, they get a, a messenger angel come in the middle of the night and say, get up right now and leave, go to Egypt. That God has plans and purposes for our lives. But things can happen along the way. That we have something inside of us that God wants to, to bring forth and for us to birth. And I know that we might feel wearied and I know we might feel stressed out and, and depressed at times, but as we walk in faith, not to stay in the situation we're at, not to stay in that fear, but press forward and walk in faith, just like Mary and Joseph, that something miraculous is going to happen in our lives. Amen? One thing that also came about, it's kind of like a hybrid message. I wasn't going to use this, but the Lord just put it on my heart because it's another funny story. But one thing we also need to see is, and it wasn't in our text, it was in Matthew's account, but we need to make room for him. When God has a change of plans for us, that we need to make room. Amen? That we can't just try and focus on our little thing and focus on our ideas because Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Amen? We can make all the plans for our lives, but is it his purpose for us that is going to prevail? As long as we continue to follow after him, all the plans might be washed away and his purpose will be prevailed in our lives. Amen? That's the reason maybe why some people don't like to plan. They're like, I know his purpose is going to prevail anyway. Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen? Anyway, so to make room that we need to make room, there were certain people in this story, in both accounts, that had to make room for God's promise and for his purpose to be established and to take place for the Savior of the world to come and be birthed inside of a flesh body, which, is all, which he was also God. He's the God-man. So he's, he's 100% God, 100% man. That Mary had to make room, literally, for Jesus, for a Savior to come. Joseph had to make room, even though it didn't feel comfortable, he had to make room. And it says as soon as he found out in Matthew's account that an angel had to confirm it to him, why couldn't the angel came to both of them at the same time, right? That would have caused a lot of stress and worry not to, not to be there, okay? But all of a sudden, he has to worry and stress, and I'm sure he wasn't really even sleeping in the night, but an angel comes to him and says, you know, that is the Christ. That is the one that has been prophesied about. That is the Messiah. And it says that at that point, he went and took her as wife. That he went and got married. That he went to the judicial system, or he went to the courthouse, wherever they performed it, the synagogue, and says, we're getting married today. Because he was righteous. He didn't want his wife and the promise of God and the purpose of God to be embarrassed. That he stood up as a man of God and covered his wife and covered the blessing that he had to make room, amen? That we see the shepherds, they made room. They went and saw this wonderful sight. What are, after we see this wonderful sight, what are we going to do? We've got to go see this, this birth, this newborn king. And it says that they went and told everyone. They made room for Jesus. We see the wise men, they made room. They traveled a far distance to come and see this wonderful thing. That they weren't even Christians. They didn't even believe in the God that the Israelites believed in, in the one true God, that they were in astrology and all that kind of stuff. But something that God can speak to people in certain signs and wonders and bring about salvation, that they came and worshipped. They bowed down their knees and worshipped him. Other people that didn't make room was the, the innkeeper. Herod didn't make room, but God's purposes will prevail. No matter what his plans were, God's purposes prevailed. You need to know this morning that God's purpose will prevail for your life. Someone say, God's purpose will prevail in my life. Emily and I were traveling in India. I need to go on, I need to go on missions trip more often. I have so many illustrations to bring for that trip. It's like, I need to do this once a year. We were traveling to India. We went, we went for a short time, if you didn't know. We went last year, and it was about three, three and a half weeks. And we went, we flew into northern India, and that was more of a, um, a tourist attraction for the most part. That's where, like, all the cool stuff is for the most part. Um, and then we flew down into southern India, and that's where the ministry was going to take place. And that's when I really became thankful for TSA. 
<laughs> and our planes that we have here, when you fly domestic and international, it's like you find out that like people are a lot shorter, you know, and you're thankful that we have deodorant here and we can shower somewhat regularly. It's, I mean, when you Anyways, we flew in, and it was late at night, so this mission came and picked us up. I think it was the town, Trichy. It's short for something long, and only about two vowels in it. And so we flew into this town called Trichy. The, the missions team, two guys, awesome guys, came in and picked us up. They take us out to dinner, you know, and we're kind of just like, okay, nice, what? Indian food again? Wow, praise the Lord. You know, and so we go, and they take us to a hotel. We don't get to the hotel about till about one in the morning, right? And so we get there, and you have to give every time, if you're, if you're a tourist, if you have a passport, if you're not from that country, every hotel, you have to give your passport. They have to run it through the system, check everything out, all that. So we had a group of 10, so it took some time. And so finally, you know, we get our, we get our passport back, we get our hotel key, you know, and we're like halfway through the group. So we go back up into our room, we open the door, and it's like, whew, cigarette smoke. And I mean... We don't like cigarette smoke as it is. You know, I know there's some people that kind of like it. Oh, I like pipe tobacco, you know, the cherry flavor. I mean, some like, yeah. I mean, but there, there's, they have different regulations, I think, over there. Because this cigarette smoke smelled smell totally, it wasn't weed. Okay, I know what weed smelled like. So, I mean, some people are like, <laughs> you sure it wasn't, you know. No, it wasn't, you know. It was a cigarette, it was a tobacco smell, but it was like a funky smell, right? So we walk in, and, and Emily, I mean, she, she's like very sensitive to that, and I'm just like, oh, I'm so tired, Let's, whatever, I don't care. But so we're like, oh, we start to get nauseous, like one minute into it, because of the cigarette smell, we're like, oh, we can't handle it. So we go back down, and the people are still there, um, uh, uh, I think the last guy, the guy that was leading it on our team, and then the people that took us there, they were still down at the front desk, we're like, hey, it smells really bad, like cigarette smell, all this kind of stuff. They're like, what? And so they start talking in their Indian language really bad. And it's like down in southern India, they go like this. I don't know. I, don't know. Mm. I mean, I can't do it because their neck is like all loose and stuff. But I mean, you seriously, like if you haven't seen, what's the movie, the baseball? Million Dollar. If you haven't seen that movie, it's like you kind of start to understand. And that's like, it's, I mean, it totally starts to make sense. But like, so they're going on this conversation all of a sudden. Blah, 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 blah. And, I mean, that's, they, that's how they do that. They're, talk, they're being nice to each other, but it's just like, okay, I'm trying. Please, if someone's listening, I am not racist. I love Indian men and women and in the Lord. But that this started to take place, and they're like, we told you that we need non-smoking rooms. You know how much business we give to this? This ministry gets people in weekly. So they pour into this hotel. So all of a sudden, stuff happens. They're like, okay, okay, just wait here in the lobby. So we were waiting in the lobby for like around a half an hour. And we were so tired. It was like 1.32 by this time all this thing was taking place. So finally we're like, you know what? We got to get up in four and a half hours and start on a long bus journey. We can handle a little smoke. You know, I mean, we're on a mission trip, right? All these hotels are pretty extravagant they were staying at. And they're like, it's like smoke. So we're like, okay, whatever. So they took our keys from us, so we're just thinking that they're going to clean up the room, you know, while well, well we go. So we go over there, and we knock on the door, you know, and we're waiting. All of a sudden, this, like, half-naked Indian man, huh, uh, uh, is like, sorry, wrong room. And we kind of, like, turn and walk away, and we're thinking, did we? That's the right, that was the number, right? We're walking away. And then all of a sudden, someone found us like from the ministry and from our, 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 the ministry team, but also from the hotel. We're like, oh, come on over here. Da, da, da. They take us up another flight of stairs and over. And as we come there, there's five employees that are finishing mopping, cleaning up, changing sheets, all this kind of stuff for us. They made room for us, right? They made room for this ministry. So I guess my point, I don't know why, is kick out any half-naked Indian man in your life. <laughs> That's the point, I guess. No, but you need to make room, right? You need to make room for what God has for you. No matter the hardship, no matter if it's a neighbor that comes in the middle of midnight and comes knocking, hey, I got something for, my, some friends came in, I need some food to be put before them. I need something. Make room for God, what he has for you, amen? And his plans, his purpose will prevail for our lives. Make sure our plans don't get in the way of God's purpose. Whenever we come into contact with Jesus, we need to be ready and prepared for change plans. 
Amen? The life he's going to lead us on is going to be a journey. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be satisfying. It's going to be fulfilling. But there are going to be some change plans along the way. We need to know that. We saw it in the disciples' lives. They were fishermen. They thought they were always going to be fishermen. All of a sudden, Jesus came to them and said, come follow me. And all of a sudden, boom, their plans changed for their entire life. In essence, Mary is the first disciple. In actuality... She made room for Jesus. She was the first one to make room for Jesus, and she followed him the whole life of Jesus while he was on earth, even to the cross and even beyond. So don't let a disturbance mess up our destiny. Mary had a disturbance that happened to her. She had a plan that happened to her. God's plan happened to her. And she could have said no. She could have pushed it away but it ended up leading to her destiny. We can make plans, we have plans for our lives, but it's God's purpose for our lives that will prevail. That's why he desires us. He can use us. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary, he said, in my translation, it says rejoice, but it's more of a greeting. It's like hail, hail. Greetings, highly favored one. At that time, I know that Mary was not feeling very highly favored. It says that she pondered at his greeting, highly favored. We like to think that we're highly favored, that we're blessed. Especially in our culture, especially being Christians over here in in Western civilization in in the United States, we're blessed. You know, I'm blessed. How's it going? Oh, I'm blessed. Praise the Lord. I'm favored. Why? Oh, everything went well. Everything went perfect in my life this week. Wow, cool. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed, man. Oh, why? I got a front row spot in the mall. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're blessed of the Lord. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm blessed. Favored. Highly favored. Oh, wow. What happened? Oh, a bunch of money came in. See, that's the extent sometimes of our thought process of being blessed, of being favored. But in this era, in this culture, when someone was favored, when someone was blessed, it was not only for them. We think sometimes that it's strictly for us, that, I'm, that I have more than enough and maybe some to give away. But in this era, in this time frame, even throughout the whole Old Testament, that we see that the favor and the blessing is not strictly for that person because those people went through some hardships. They went through some tough times. But it's for the people that are around them, the people that would follow after them. That we can see of all that throughout the Old Testament, you could see about Abraham. He was blessed because he was going to be a father of many nations. But he went through some hardships, didn't he? We see Joseph. He was highly favored, but what happened? He was sold by his brother. He had to spend the night in, or spend time in prison. But what happened? He was favored because he was making room for a, for a nation to be able to come in to another land during a time of great famine. We see Moses, he was blessed, he was favored of the, of the Lord, but he went through hardships in his life. He went through lonely and depression periods. But what happened? He was able to be the deliverer of God's people who were in slavery and in oppression. This word, highly favored, I, as I was studying it, it kind of struck me. There's a couple things that happen when, when, when you study Scripture and, and you start to see different words. This word, highly favored, is actually one word in the Greek. It's called keratuo. It's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. It's highly favored. It's right here. That's why Catholics pray to Mary because it says, Hail Mary, full of grace. Da, 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 da. That's as much as I know of it. I've been to one Mass, I think, so. Um... Anyways, but we need to know there's only two times that it's mentioned here. That's, that's a red flag for us when we study the Bible, either if it's mentioned a lot, if it's mentioned like 50 times in, in one book, or it's mentioned only twice, that we need to know that, that there is something that, that is there that God wants to speak to us. And so many times we can place her on a pedestal, which, you know, she should be, you know, not glorified. We don't pray to her, but... She was someone that laid down her life for Jesus, you know? Someone that's held in high esteem, just like the apostles, just like Moses, just like all these mighty men and women of God that we read through the Bible. But there's one other time that this word is used, and it's in Ephesians 1.6. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. The word accepted there is the same word, highly favored. 
He made us accepted in the beloved. If the, our Paul is not talking to the church of Ephesus about Mary. He's talking about Christians, about believers who are inside the church. That we can have that same high favor upon our lives as did Mary, the mother of Jesus. We're not going to birth the next Christ, the next Messiah. But that God has some high favor that he wants, that karatuo to be placed upon you. What, what is karatuo? What, how different is it than, than just regular grace? It's grace, but it goes beyond that. It's an overflowing grace. It's an abundant grace. It can be termed as a super grace or to make graceful. It can be encompassed with favor. My favorite is to pursue with grace. That God pursues us with his grace. When we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we know that he pursues us with his grace. Amen? Amen. That we've been accepted in the beloved, that we've been accepted in Jesus Christ, that he has highly favored us, that he's filled us with his grace, that unmerited favor, that he has pursued us, even though it might seem like hardship, even though there might seem some turmoil going on in my life, even though my, my bank account and my, my savings is next to zero. No matter what, that you are highly favored and God is trying to release something in your life, that he wants to birth something in your life in this hardship that he wants to teach you in this time. That's one thing I have learned when Paul says, I've learned to be abound and to abase. That he's learned in those times, in those seasons, to hear from God what his plans are for our lives. When we go through those hardships, when we go through maybe losing a baby or losing a marriage or losing a job, that there's something that he wants to instill in us. There's a, a level of character, a reinforming of, of our image in Christ Jesus that he's trying to form inside of us, that he's trying to renew something inside of us. Amen? That there's something he's trying to build inside of us. So I, I urge you, if, if there's something you're going through this morning or this season or even this year, or maybe even this next year, something's going to hit you, blindside you, and knock you off your horse, that ask in those times, God, what can you teach me? What are you trying to teach me? Even though I know you don't cause calamity, that it's all from the enemy. Even though these things happen to me, that you can turn what the devil, what evil, what the enemy meant for evil, and you can turn it around for good. Amen? Amen. That there's something there that he's still trying to bring about in our lives. That it's a journey. It's not a destination. Amen. That it's a journey, this walk, this relationship with Jesus Christ. That we need to know when we truly understand that I've been accepted, that I've been highly favored, just as Mary did. And she had to sit back. She had to ponder. Man, what kind of a greeting is this? How can I be highly favored? I'm just this poor girl. I'm just going to marry a carpenter. How can I be highly favored? There's, I don't have anyone around me. I don't have anyone following me. I barely know anyone. How can I be highly favored? I pray that we would have that same response as Mary did. to be Let it be according to your word. Even if I don't feel highly favored, you are. Even if you don't feel blessed, you are. Even if the family situation, living conditions are a mess, you're blessed and you're favored. Amen? But we must know and stand back once we realize that we're favored, that we're blessed, that there is a price to pay. Just like with Mary, there's a price to pay. With Joseph, there is a price to pay. With knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. But the reward is so fulfilling. We may not be carrying the next Messiah. We aren't. May not. That leaves the room. <laughs> not going to be carrying the next Messiah. But we are carrying something that God wants to birth through our lives. Through the hardship. Through the pain. That may bring deliverance that will bring life, that will bring love, that will bring redemption to those around us and those who are coming up behind us. As we leave this place today, I pray that we would ask God to reveal his purpose, his plans in our lives, even though we might have plans, even though we already know what we got people for Christmas or maybe 
or still haven't even bought any Christmas presents yet. That no matter what comes this season, I pray that we would all be able to say, when trials do come, that we would be able to come to the Lord and say, let it be according to your will. Let it be according to your purpose. Let it be according to what you have for me. Amen? Amen. Can I have the worship team come up? We're going to sing a song.